In this chapter, we're going to spend a lot of time discussing the structure of an atom and the components that make it up. You should have just gotten done watching a video on the basic structure of an atom. A lot of that video was review from chapter two, but I thought it was a good thing for you to have you go ahead and watch it because I, what I wanted you to do is to really get a good solid picture in your mind of what the structure of an atom looks like. The gentleman in the video did a really good job explaining that the mass of the protons and neutrons, which are in the center, is far greater than the mass of the electrons, which are orbiting around the outside. And I thought he also did a very good job illustrating just the size differences in the nucleus and the electron cloud around the atom. He compared the nucleus of the, the protons and the neutrons together in the center. He said, if that were the size of a grape, then the electrons would be nearly a mile away. And while we will hit that a little bit later in this particular chapter, the idea of the sheer amount of empty space in an atom then helps you get a better appreciation for what Dalton and Rutherford were talking about in the chapter that we did, or that we just finished. Dalton, if you remember, initially said that an atom looked more like plum pudding. And most students today don't know what plum pudding is. And so I like to compare it instead to a chocolate chip cookie. A chocolate chip cookie is a lot of dough with chocolate chips kind of scattered throughout. And that's what Dalton thought an atom looked like. He thought that the chocolate chips in the cookie were the negatively charged electrons. And he's, the rest of the cookie dough then was the positively charged. Uh, he didn't realize there were protons at that point, but it was a big positively charged mass. And so he figured, um, Rutherford figured that when he shot those positive particles at that chocolate chip cookie, what should happen is that because the electrons were pretty well evenly spread out among all this positively charged cookie dough, that the positive particles that he was shooting at it would just go straight through because the charges were all pretty well balanced. And as you remember, it didn't turn out that way simply because what was happening was that most of them did go straight through and now you understand that that's because the vast majority of the atom is empty space but once in a while you would have a positively charged particle that would hit a nucleus and then it would bounce backwards or it would bounce off to the side depending on the angle at which it had hit and that really really surprised Rutherford because he said it's almost like if I took a 15 inch shell and I shot it at a piece of tissue paper and it flew backwards at me which you certainly of course would not expect but that is what then gave them the idea that the positively charged particles must be packed together tightly in the center of the atom they assumed and then the electrons must be around the outside and there must be a lot of empty space involved in that atom so now that you have a a better picture of what that atomic structure is like, hopefully those, those two models and Rutherford's discovery make a little bit more sense to you and you realize just how, how important that they were. We're going to be using the periodic table a lot in this chapter and as we continue throughout and it's perfectly fine with me if you want to use the one that's in the book. I did scan and send you this particular periodic table and the reason I did it is because this copy of the periodic table has the names of the elements on there. I don't feel that it's necessary, even though the author of your textbook says that you need to memorize the first 20 elements on the table. I don't think it's necessary for you to do that because the more you use them, you're going to have them memorized relatively quickly anyway. So um, you're welcome to use whichever periodic table you like. Um, Regardless of what you do, if you use the one in the book or if you use the one I sent you, you might want to make a photocopy of it so that you can lay it down next to your book on the table where you're working and you're not constantly having to flip your book back and forth because um, you're going to be referring to it a lot. So um, you'll notice that the atomic numbers that were talked about, um, the atomic numbers are in the book, they're on the top of the box and on this table, the atomic numbers are in the bottom left-hand corner. The atomic numbers are the numbers that are not decimals. So they go one, two, three, four, five, six. And so if you notice, you have a one and then a two, then you've got three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And so they, they're just going to go straight across the periodic table. The other number in the box is a decimal number 
and that number is the atomic mass. Now, the gentleman in the video, again, he explained that the majority of the mass in an atom comes from the protons and the neutrons, which are in the middle. Electrons do have some mass, but in relation to the protons and the neutrons, the mass of the electrons is very, very, very tiny, and so we don't even worry about the mass of the electrons when we're talking about the mass of an atom. So, one thing that I want to be sure that you know how to do is to use your scientific calculator because you're definitely going to need that not only in this chapter but in many of the chapters to come. Um, if you look at neon, neon, its symbol is NE and it's on the, in the right hand column, it's the second one down on the periodic table. So if you've got a periodic table, um, find that particular element. You will find that the atomic mass of that element says 20.18. And that is in AMUs. Now what's an AMU? It's an atomic mass unit, and it's approximately the number, or it's approximately the mass of either a proton or a neutron. AMUs are a very, very tiny unit. Um, a gram isn't very much either, but in comparison, one atomic mass unit is 1.66 times 10 to the minus 24th grams. Um, this is in your textbook. Um, you don't have to have it memorized. It will be on uh, any of the any test or anything that you're that you need it for. It will be given to you. So again, you don't need to memorize that. So let's say that I want to convert this into grams. This conversion is exactly the same as the, the type of conversions that we were doing in the first chapter. So hopefully you won't find it very difficult. You're going to take the 20.18 AMUs that you're given, and you're going to put it over one. Then you need to take this relationship and put it into a conversion factor so that the AMUs will cancel. So the one AMU is gonna go on the bottom and 1.66 times 10 to the minus 24 grams is gonna go on the top. So your AMUs will cancel out and you're going to be left with units of grams. Now you may not have exactly the same scientific calculator that I have um, and if you don't, that's fine. I'm going to show you how to do it on this one. Um, if you're having trouble figuring out how to use yours, um, see if one of your parents knows how to use it. It should have come with an instruction manual. You pull the instruction manual out and look at that. If all else fails, take a picture of it, send it to me, and I'll try to help you uh, figure out how to, how to get it typed in correctly. So if you're going to do this particular problem on your calculator, uh, first thing you're going to do is you're going to type in 20.18 and then you're going to hit the multiplication sign. When you're going to type in this number, this is the part that you would need to be really careful about. This times 10 gets taken care of when you hit the exponent key. Um, on this Texas Instruments calculator, uh, the exponent key is, a, is an EE, two capital E's. On some calculators, it will say EXP, so it will just depend what particular kind of calculator you have. The biggest problem that I see is that students will try to hit a multiplication sign and then it messes everything up. So you wanna be very, very careful when you type it in. So I've typed in 20.18, I've already hit the multiplication sign, and so then what you wanna do is you wanna type in one, 0.66, you're going to hit the EE key, and then you're going to type in negative 24, and then you're going to hit the equal sign, okay? Now, what that should give you is 3.35 times 10 to the negative 23rd. And again, it doesn't look like that on the calculator. It looks like 3.35 with a negative 23 up here in the air. But that's not what it means, it means this. So be sure that when you write the answer down, don't write this because this means something completely different than what this does. So you wanna write 3.35 times 10 to the negative 23rd, and you do need three significant figures there because there's three significant figures in this particular conversion factor. So what I want you to do is to type that into your calculator, make sure you can get it to work, um, along with the practice problems, the example problems that they give you in the book. Type those into your calculator, make sure you get the same answer that they do so that you know you're using your calculator properly.